Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth episode of the series about civil disobedience in Historia Politica Publica. In the former three episodes we talk about a core problem of political theory, which is what does one owe to the state or political community? What is political obligation? It is something that must be obedient uh, no matter what happened. The interconnectedness of law and politics figures like Henry de Pithoreau, which is considered the father of political obedience. And in this episode, I would like to continue with these questions, how a person can legitimize their acts of disobedience and give some contemporary example. So the last episode I finished talking about the Rawlsian concept of uh, named by John Rawls, it's called Justice as Fairness, which implies that people shall have social equality. Henceforth, if there is inequality in a society, is it uh, correct to act uh, with civil disobedience um, approaches? Uh, this is important because why should a political or legal obligation of a country have priority over international legislation, such as the Declaration of Human Rights? So, for example, if we think in the demonstrations of Iran today, what is happening after the murder of Mashamini that has created a spark in Iran to create a huge turmoil of social movement, it seems that uh, people from the international sphere is supporting the movements because we believe that their struggle is something which is right. At the same time, it's illegal because they are fighting against their own government. So it is, they have this law, very rigid law, in which they cannot protest, they cannot uh, blame on the regime. So those people are uh, doing something which is illegal, but we believe which is morally correct. So here we see another example of the contracts uh, between political obligation, legal obligation and moral obligation. It's like with the uh, climate change uh, movement, the ecologic uh, activists which uh, protest uh, in different regions of the world, like gluing themselves in the streets, also like the feminist movement uh, or LGBTQ plus communities, which they have been protesting since in the last centuries, even though it was illegal. Or when you are living under a dictatorship and you revolt against the regime, such as the people against Francoism in 1960s, 1970s, in Portugal against Salazar, um, or in Italy and Germany against fascism. So here you see how uh, people are uh, committing acts that are illegal, but morally we may believe that they are acting in a correct manner. Although I spoke, as I spoke in the last episode, Morality is something very ambiguous and as Hannah Arendt explained very well, what happens if a person believes in uh, him or herself that uh, it is morally correct to murder uh, thousands of people or oppress some minorities and so on. And at the same time, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights, which was something uh, which was basically born after 1945, after the Second World War, and it started to be used constantly in the Declaration of the Human Rights and also in the international sphere as a kind of a uh, bulwark against uh, uh, the return of fascism, another kind of movement. But it, it is interesting because even though the human rights uh, significant start to be expanded after 1947, 48, with the start of the Cold War. It is uh, it didn't um, impede that there were crimes committed in the colonies such as Algeria or India or other regions in Africa. Um, then what happened when the International Declaration of Human Rights collide with what is happening in each country? Obviously, this is a rhetorical question because as we see, the international institutions doesn't have that much power, especially if they collide with the interests of uh, the USA or other superpower. We can see with the, for example, with the killings in the 1960s and 70s in the US 
and other movement that obviously they broke with the idea of human rights, but still they were carried on. Uh, well, I believe personally that political obligation does not really exist. It's kind of myth. It's a construct similar to the Leviathan of Thomas Hobbes, uh, which that doesn't mean that it's not important. It helps people to believe in the, that they have political obligation. It is comprehensible. People may feel alliance with the state as long as it provides with security. This is like the Hobbesian by Thomas Hobbes, the promise of the sign of the social control that I spoke in the last episode. Social control is a kind of alliance between the people in order to carry on in a peaceful society. But here lies different problems. For example, for the political theorist Judith Sklar, it lies in a conflict of loyalties in which people may feel more aligned with a certain social group rather than the state. For her, the personal fidelity that we saw to was to our loved ones or an identification with certain groups may base upon political obligation. So you live in a state and you believe that you are a patriot, that you want to obey all the laws, even though that those that are unfair, you have this premise upon your mouth which says you must... Um, comply with the legislation and with the constitution but what happens if suddenly the state does something which is against the interest of your family which side will you support more the side of the law even though the laws are unfair according to your opinion or your family people who you see you like uh, your loved ones your friends and so on and this is something that uh judith sklar point very well when she divides in fight fidelity, loyalty, and obligation. Another concern with the social contract, which might be the core of political relations, is the fact that many of us have not signed this social contract, really. I mean, it's a, a construct uh, said by uh, Rousseau, Kant, or Thomas Hobbes. Rousseau put this idea of the general will in which apparently all the society must have the same interest, which this is... Uh, I mean, it's something of a myth, same as the Hobbesian idea, or Kant when he explains about the categorical imperative, something which must be compliant no matter what, something which is going to be always truth, such as the absolute truth, which in this era of postmodernism, it seems something quite anachronic to think about like that. Then um, there is also um, Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, which is explicit when he says that the government cannot act upon himself uh, unless he consents to it. So this is like the government needs the push of the people in order to implement legislation which will support the majority of the people. But what happens then when there is a minority which voices are not listened do they deserve right? I believe so. Um, but how can we do to push these rights toward them and channel it in a society which will be better for everybody? Even those who acquire a citizenship in a foreign country may refuse to obey an immoral law. Let's say that I become British, I pass the exam and I take the citizenship in Great Britain, but I believe that the laws are unfair. What happened then? Um, because I am originally from Spain, I lived there for nine years, I take the citizenship. Do I have the right to disobey the laws that I consider unfair? Those are just questions that I am asking in order that you can uh, have uh, exploration, delve into it in order to maybe eventually have uh, with some answer. My personal opinion, as you know, is that if a law is unfair, we should disobey that law. And I am up always for civil disobedience in a non-violent manner. I have been doing that for the last years and I think it's very useful also to engage with people and that gives you legitimacy to your demands. Obviously, I speak that as I mentioned before because I live in a country where you have freedom to speak, but obviously if you are living in, in, under dictatorial regime, such as Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, you have um, <clears throat> Russia now, or you have, if you are living in, in Israel, in the, in the Palestine, in the occupied Palestine side of Israel, obviously uh, you have 
you should have the right to disobey in a more uh, forceful manner because you don't have right and people are pushing you and henceforth this is uh, following the idea of uh, Max Weber or Leon Trotsky that every state has always been founded by, by violence so if you are suffering the systemic oppressing violence of the state you have the right to um, to counteract it. I mean the, the Portuguese revolution, the ca the Carnage Revolution of 1974, it was carried because the military sided with the people and they basically started to shoot the uh, building in which the dictators were there and all the government had to flee. Um, that was, uh, um, obviously the Carnage Revolution was a non-violent movement, but at the same time the militars used actually guns to uh, overthrow the dictatorship. So. Every situation has their own particularities and obviously now if you want to change the regime in England, for example, you cannot go to parliament and uh, with guns and weapons and doesn't make sense, doesn't work like that. But if you are living under a totalitarian regime, uh, who is blaming the Iranian women and men for protesting in the streets? Nobody, I believe. I mean, probably there will be people that they do that. But, um, Overall, people support these protests because they see them as legitimacy causes and because they cannot uh, use their right to change the system in another means. They need to channel all the anger uh, in order to push for an overthrow of their regime. Going back to the social contrast, uh, where Hobbes and Kant explicitly express the, the law must be obeyed no matter what, John Locke, for example, point to the right to rebel. Locke is a contemporary of Thomas Hobbes and is one of the pioneers of the social contract, this idea, the idea of liberalism, <clears throat> and he believed that we have a right to rebel when we think that the laws are not fair. Not less important are the racial contract and the sexual contract. Those are kind of analogies of the um, social contract but uh, upon different perspectives. So, for example, the racial contract, um, it was uh, theorized by Charles Mills and the uh, sexual contract was uh, created by Carol Payman. Basically, what they say is like, OK, Charles Mills say if we have a social contract, which is all only benefiting the white upper classes, bourgeoisie, uh, such as was created in the 17th, 18th century. What happened with the black people and other minorities uh, of color? How, that, how do we earn our rights? Similarly, Carol Pateman with the sexual contract believes say exactly the same. Like, okay, what about the women who are being oppressed in the private sphere? They don't have right to speak. They don't have uh, the same... Um, rights as the, the men and so on. So those, uh, the racial, the racial contract and the sexual contract appear as a counter uh, fact uh, about the social contract. And even there is a, an interesting conversation between both of them, between Carol Payman and Charles Mills, in which they speak about the weakness of the social contract and how that was used to exclude a huge group of people in society. It's important to believe, um, <clears throat> to realize that the social contract was created more or less in the, in the time of the English Revolution, in which this was a time where the bourgeoisie wanted right just for themselves, not for the whole people, um, and henceforth there was an increase of right, but just for a tiny sector of population. So this idea of progress to expand the right for the whole community makes sense when you read the racial contract and the sexual contract that are very important for our current societies, which means that we need to keep increasing rights for different collectives. And for example, in Spain, they have been approving interesting laws such as the trans uh, gender law, which uh, this is another step towards progress and something which perhaps 50, 60 years ago, it was unthinkable. But this is idea how the social contract we don't have to read it literally anymore because now we have a diversity of people who all want voice. That doesn't mean that in the past it was not the same. It was exactly the same. But now we are lucky because we have more access to education and this is this makes the difference over the world. Whereas in the past, only just a tiny percentage of the population have the right to go to university and to get knowledge nowadays. Many people can learn, not 
not just on the high school or university, but also through reading books, borrowing the library or through the internet. So it's important that we keep informed in order to see what is happening around us. And this is fundamental for the progress of the society. Um, so the idea is like, as they they denounced those legislation who had been used to legitimize the oppression. I want to do an, an episode about how uh, the superpowers, England, France, Germany, at the end of this 19th century, they organized themselves in order to legitimize their exploitation of the colonies. They rationalized very well uh, this idea of how the white people were superior to others in order to give themselves the, the le legitimacy they needed in order to go to Africa, to Asia, kill thousands of people and expand themselves into these territories. So, I am going to finish here and for the last one of this series I will start speaking about Martin Luther King and sum up some of their conclusions.